Felicia Cilio, and we have Steve Cole with us. And we're going to be talking about the evolution and challenges of Alaska's rail belts electric grid. Um, so first, I just want to do a brief overview of like, what is a rail belt? Why do we call it the rail belt? Um, so in Alaska, we have the Alaska Railroad, which runs from Fairbanks down to um, Seward. And the transmission system approximately follows the railroad, which is why we call it the rail belt. Um, so we're going to do a brief history of electrification in Alaska, go over remote microgrids and regional microgrids, um, do a little bit more about the rail belt, and then go over some significant studies and challenges, upcoming changes, both real and potential changes, and then a bit on um, ASAP, the Alaska Center for Energy and Power um, Research and Rail Belt Research. Uh, so first, this is um, a picture of some electrification data for Alaska. Alaska's history of electrification is similar in a lot of ways to the rest of the country. Uh, around the 1940s, uh, regional electric co-ops were formed in the major population centers of um, Anchorage and Fairbanks. And that also includes just north of Anchorage in the Palmer Wasilla area where a lot of farmers um, immigrated to. And this was after the 1936 Federal Rural Electrification Act was passed. Well, similar patterns of electrification happened all across the country. It can see in the figure that um, the Anchorage and Palmer area that in the yellow lines um, were some of the first areas to be electrified. Um, there are also about um, 200 remote microgrids that are scattered across the country. Um, and there are also other regional grids within Alaska other than the Railbelt, which includes uh, the Southeast down in Juneau, Ketchikan, farther South, Southeast. And then there's also a small regional um, grid in the Valdez to Glen Allen area, which is near Anchorage, just to the east of Anchorage. Um, but neither of those regional grids are connected to the rail belt grid. So going a little bit deeper into um, the rail belt electric grid, uh, here's the overview of the rail belt electrical co-ops. Um, there were five, now there's four. Um, and in addition to the rail belt, there's that um, regional grid just to the east um, called Copper Valley. Uh, this is in the Glen Allen and Valdez area and serves about 35 megawatts of load. Um, this system is not connected to the rail belt. Um, there have been some studies to look at if it would benef be beneficial to connect the Copper Valley system to the rail belt, um, but currently there are no plans to connect the two. Uh, as I just mentioned earlier, the Railboat Electric Co-ops were incorporated and electrified in the 1940s. Um, and they're listed here in order of when they were incorporated. Uh, the first to be incorporated was Matanuska Electric Association. First was MEA. Um, we'll probably end up referring to these electric co-ops by their abbreviations later, but um, we should be able to slide, share the slides with you later so you can look up these terms. Um, MEA's co-op territory is in the Palmer Wasilla area. Um, and then there is Golden Valley Electric, which we call GVA, and this is Fairbanks, and it goes all the way down to Healy, which is kind of near um, Denali National Park, and all the way east over to um, Delta Junction. Uh, there was uh, Anchorage's Municipal Light and Power, and um, that was recently acquired by Chugach Electric, which is called CEA, which has like, the greater Anchorage area. And then last but not least, there is Homer Electric. Um, called HEA, and that's down on all over the Kenai Peninsula. So um, if we look at the load, it's <laughs> you'll see a uh, comparison to California in a minute, but it's tiny by sort of any, any standard other than our own. And furthermore, uh, our load, I guess you could say it, it peaks at around 800 megawatts. But the purpose of this slide is to emphasize that we are in a, a flat or declining load situation. Some of which relates to one or two large industrial loads, but we have very few of those mines. And so this decline is sort of a, an overall decline that's probably consistent with a lot of other places where we're getting more efficient. And In, in, any, in any event, 
it's kind of the backdrop for all the thinking and all the utility uh, concerns that they're dealing with today. So um, I'll leave it at that other than maybe uh, Felicia is gonna come back to this or I will, but the uh, links in this slide between the blue load centers show the transfer capacities of the transmission system. And as we'll talk about later, a couple of these links, these transfer capacities are, are so minuscule that it really makes this uh, rail belt system just a, a arguably a poorly connected collection of regional microgrids. Okay, let's go on. So building off of what Steve said that the rail belt is tiny, um, for perspective, I wanted to get some perspective into California and lower 48s. Um, so on the right, that's a picture from California ISO, and that shows the transmission system of California, which I'm sure you all are very familiar. And now I tried to keep that picture to scale with the energy infrastructure map of Alaska in the middle there. And I've highlighted where the rail belt runs in orange. Um, so the rail belt's peak load, I think it's a little bit more than this, but is around 1,000 megawatts in perspective to California. So it's their peak load is around 45,000 megawatts. So California's load is 45 times larger. Um, however, if you look at the geographic distance being spanned, it's it's like somewhat comparable, maybe half, maybe a little bit more than half in terms of distances. Um, so as you can imagine, when you're having really long lines with low loads, you're having weak grid issues and lots of other engineering challenges associated with that um, that we'll get into later. And as Steve mentioned, there's only a single transmission line between several of these load areas. That's between Anchorage and Fairbanks and down from Anchorage to Kenai. So in comparison to the California system, there's, you know, many pathways to get electricity from the north to the south in California and different regions in between. But in the rail belt, we only have one single transmission path between Fairbanks and Anchorage and Anchorage and Kenai. So that causes significant, um, like, perhaps unnecessary congestion and issues related to renewable energy power transfers that we'll get into in a bit. Over to you. Okay, so here's a little more history of uh, how how we got you know, where we are, and uh, basically our the the build out of our generation capacity has everything to do with uh, two or two or three circumstances. One of one of the the first circumstance, I think, was uh, sort of the territorial days when people built, built some hydro and there were some, some attractive small hydro resources that worked in the 50s. And then Fairbanks uh, had to do something in the 60s, so they built a 28 megawatt coal plant because uh, a coal mine opened, not just for electric power, but for general purpose um, sales. So I guess you could say they took advantage of the coal. Then we had a kind of serendipitous discovery of oil. And I'm not talking about North Slope oil. I'm talking about the oil close to Anchorage in the Cook Inlet. And it had a huge amount of natural gas as a, essentially an economic byproduct. So people jumped up and said, all right, we can heat all our homes with gas. We can run all our generators with gas. Let's get fracking. And uh, the folk wisdom, I think it's correct, is that gas, natural gas in those days was less than a dollar per thousand cubic feet, which if you know anything about your gas markets is a pretty, pretty good deal for natural gas. Uh, we built two by four framed homes in Alaska with wall to wall windows because you had endless cheap gas. 
And we ramped up the generation uh, in the 70s. You can see uh, beluga gas, major, major build out of gas generation. And it only, it uh, mirrored the discovery of North Slope oil, which made the whole state boom and caused, you know, the need. So we had the oil pipeline and we had oil. And then uh, in the eighties, we had oil money. And the result of the oil money was actually not very much new generation built, but uh, we flirted and we are still flirting now with a mega hydro project. So the main result of the oil money was a massive hydro project on the Susitna River that was not built, but we got awfully close. And the, the real outcome of the whole oil money era for the electric grid was one hydro project known as Bradley Lake, so it's 120 megawatts. So a kind of medium size deal. Then we went uh, rolling on through the, the 90s and the 2000s. And I'll just, I won't fill in any details there because they're not very exciting. And in the last decade, we've seen a lot of action on the generation build front, which includes two wind farms and a really a huge uh, buildup of natural gas, additional natural gas generation, which if you look at it over on the right side of this picture, if you compare it to what's happening with the sales, a lot of people ended up scratching their heads and asking, why did we have this massive build out, which I think it cost about a billion dollars. I think some people are still scratching their heads and there are stories to be told but in any event, that's where we are today, substantially by some, uh, by some people's viewpoints, substantially overbuilt with gas generation and facing flat loads as we look into the next decade. Okay, next. Another way of looking at the timeline is to think about some of the sort of political economy of electricity in Alaska. And um, the political economy story really is the story of five or six co-ops trying to collaborate and coordinate and maybe even merge as their service territory started to bump into each other through uh, economic growth of all the load centers. So in, in the, let's say in the 80s, when I first came to Alaska, Chugach Electric in Anchorage was more or less the, the generator for the entire southern part of the state. And that was that got to be uh, kind of a sore point for the co-ops outside of Anchorage. And they finally sort of, they finally uh, said, enough, we're going to build our own generation. So Matt Nuska and Homer Electric stopped buying all their requirements from Chugach, built their own generation. And that's a big part of the story of the build out that we saw in the last slide. Then, or at the same time, I would say outside agitators, not agitators, but outside forces, outside the utilities themselves, were agitating for a little more uh, collaboration and possibly mergers or some form of organized um, coordination of the system, because it seemed apparent that it doesn't really make sense to have six utilities all doing their own thing when we should be sharing in some, in some sense. So there was a lot of hullabaloo at the regulatory commission in the political sphere, and, and this went on. Um, I'm, uh, I just saw the chat. I'm, I'm about to expand <laughs> uh, on this point. So, okay, since you asked me to expand or someone asked me to expand, here I go. So 
my uh, bio that you that was read was that was cooked up to to uh, satisfy some grant makers at the Office of Naval Research. But the real story of me is that I had the pleasure of working at the California Public Utilities Commission in 1984, looking at renewable power contracts under uh, PURPA. And I came straight to Alaska from my wonderful experience at the CPUC in San Francisco, 1984. And the very first thing that someone asked me when I got to Alaska, my boss, called me into his office and I was just a computer programmer. And he said, I understand you know about electricity and you've been in California because I said, yeah. And he said, well, we're trying to merge all the Alaska rail belt utilities. How should we do it? And I said, I don't know. And that was the end of that conversation. But the reason I bring it up is that the, the idea of consolidating all these little co-ops has been kicking around since at least 19, 80. And it reached a crescendo in the 2010s, or yeah, 2010 through 15, when a lot of outside forces really put the screws on the, um, they, they got the regulator, they got the regulators to take up, to take up the question of whether, whether and how all these co-ops needed to merge. They, they had some big docket or maybe they had 10 dockets, but they were right in there. And the utilities themselves tried, some would say in good faith, others would question how much good faith there really was. Anyway, on paper, they tried to explore an ISO, an RTO, Regional Transmission Organization, uh, various forms of power pooling and a transco. And all of these efforts, they sort of just flamed out around 2016. And the logo in the slide is, is one such effort. A lot of logos were generated during this period and a lot of paper organizations were formed. It looked good on paper, but they didn't, they weren't didn't really amount to anything. And the whole the whole thing kind of flamed out sometime in the last four years. I think the, the very last failed effort was uh, a transco potentially funded by an outside source of capital. I forget the name, maybe Felicia remembers the name. One of, one of some big American transco. And they finally said, forget it. We want nothing to do with you guys. And that, that was the end of that. So um, that's my expansion on our, our failed ISO Transco RTO um, effort. And we'll probably have time to have further questions about that. So another good question, is there a reason why the grids were not interconnected? Well, they are interconnected by these weak transmission lines and uh, however, I'm speaking, wearing my economist hat here, it's not obvious that they would be interconnected, at least not the Fairbanks to Anchorage uh, group. That transmission line was built by the state with oil money. And it's not obvious that the utilities would have financed it on their own had the state not just built it. So if you take away free oil money, I think there's an argument to be made that our loads have always been so small that it just doesn't pay to tie them together. Or it might pay on a, some kind of net present value basis, but it's unfinanceable. In other words, these co-ops could not on their own take on the requisite debt, even though it might look good. So what we have instead is we have a legacy of state funded oil money financed stuff, which includes medium sized hydro and some big transmission lines. And it's so, so it's not really even clear that the system that we see now uh, makes, makes economic sense in terms of what they would have built without the free money. I think we should go on. 
Oh, so, sorry, Alicia. You got to go back one more. Uh, there, there was, um, there was, however, one major step forward uh, uh, in this sort of consolidation uh, timeline, and that is finally in 2020, the two utilities that were serving Anchorage with, a, with a, a service territory boundary that literally ran right through the center of the city, where you could see wires on both sides of the road. We finally got that merger accomplished. So we now have one utility serving the state's largest population center. And some people are absolutely exhausted from that one effort because it really has taken 40 years. So now we can go on. So I want to touch on the major <laughs> renewable energy projects that have been built in the last 10 or so years. Um, the first one we'll talk about, it's not renewable energy, it's energy storage, but um, GVA built um, a 14 megawatt hour battery in 2003. This is also around when the Northern Intertide of Fairbanks was in, um, built. And this battery was built to help with reliability within the region. And GVA claims that the, this battery has resulted in a 60% reduction in transmission power supply type outages. And at the time when it was installed, it was actually the largest um, grid connected battery. Um, so it was pretty innovative. Um, and now, you know, that was in 2003, we are like nearing the end of this 20 to 30 year lifespan. So GVA has a lot of decisions to make um, in terms of, is it going to upgrade it, you can revamp it, is it, you know, install a new type of battery um, yeah, lots of questions there. Um, so then jumping over to 2012, um, Fire Island Wind was built. Um, Fire Island is an island um, just off the coast of Anchorage in the Cook Inlet. Um, this was actually built by um, the Native Corporation, the Cook Inlet Region uh, Incorporation called Siri. Um, and it was, it's 17.6 um, megawatts. Now also in 2012 was the Evie Creek Wind. So this is up in Healy area near Denali National Park. Um, this was also built by um, GVA and GVA's territory and is 25 megawatts. And now both of these large wind farms, I do know they curtail. Um, I don't know by how much, but I do know that they do a lot of curtailment. You can tell because of, you know, it might seem small in terms of floor 48 megawatt, you know, size, um, but in terms of rail belt, you know, Fire Island wind, almost 20 megawatts, even Creek wind over 20 megawatts. Um, that's around 10% of the Fairbanks peak load. So now um, we'll go into solar farms. There's two large solar farms um, also built some around the same time. Uh, one's a Willow solar farm that's in the town of Willow, which is just north of um, Anchorage, which serves the Manuska Electric um, Association. And then GVA up in Fairbanks also built a solar farm. These are much smaller at 1.2 megawatts in Willow and um, a half a megawatt in GVA. So next I'm gonna move on to some significant studies um, which highlighted a bunch of challenges for the region. So in 2010, the state of Alaska commissioned Black and Beach to perform the integrated resource, resource plan for the state. Um, this is a really rare example of when the state has stepped in and paid for a regional study. Um, all previous studies typically have been done by utility that we're really looking at benefits for that individual utility. So now, as you're probably familiar, the objective function of an IRP is to, or at least this IRP was to minimize regional power supply costs and improve the reliability of the system. The system as a whole versus any individual electric co-op, which has been studied in the past. Um, the results identify that there are several significant challenges. Those are associated with size and geography of this rail belt area the limited number of connections, um, which results in limited redundancy, that's at least from a transmission perspective. 
Um, so now there's these low loads and large distances. And this also contributes to limited economies of scale, also in addition to the weak grade components. Um, there is, was, and still is a very large dependence on fossil fuels. Now the transmission system is very limited. However, the, the amount of generation in these regions, you could say is overbuilt. Um, in an earlier slide uh, noted when MEA and Homer broke off from two cash in terms of they were no longer going to rely on two catch electric for all their generation. And MEA and HEA started building their own generation. So a really small system um, where there's not a lot of load. And then you have regional entities within that very small system building up all their own generation to sort of their load and have reserves. You're, if you want to consider the region as a whole system, now you're going to have a significantly overbuilt amount of generation. So, so lots of challenges that are existing. Um, yeah, so then out of this IRP, um, Black and Beach identified several um, projects that would benefit the region as a whole. Um, but several challenges exist with that. The major one being that there's really no cost sharing mechanism between the utilities to be able to pay and afford for these types of projects. Some of these projects have been done, um, but only some of the major projects that have been done were actually on this IRP list. Another significant study um, was one done by commissioned or performed by Electric Power Systems, which was commissioned by the Alaska Energy Authority, which is the state's equivalent of the, their energy, state energy department. Um, this study looked more on like the engineering side, um, looking at reliability standards. There actually are no universal or enforced reliability standards in Alaska. Like in Lower 48, there's the NERC uh, reliability standards. Because Alaska doesn't have any interstate commerce and electricity, we do not find it by any NERC reliability standards. There have been proposed Alaskan reliability standards, which is what um, EPS used um, as guidelines for what to assess reliability by, but that's actually not universally accepted across all the utilities and it's definitely not enforced. <laughs> um, so interesting challenges there. But anyway, so EPS used these, um, we'll call them temporary reliability standards to look at what needs to be done in the region to comply with these temporary reliability standards. Um, and they identified several projects, uh, many of which, these are the projects, many of which actually overlap with what had been identified in the IRP, such as increasing the capacity of the northern inner tie between Anchorage and Fairbanks, or just building a second inner tie, which would increase redundancy, and also removing, adding another inner tie between Anchorage and Kenai to remove that redundancy, and several other projects related to. Um, reliability. All right, so next we're gonna go into some of the upcoming changes. Some of these are happening, some of them might be happening. Steve, go to you to talk about the ERO. Okay, there's a little too much on this slide, so I'll try to hit some of the high points. The uh, final, well, it's not final yet. <laughs> the most current outcome of this long-standing sort of uh, two steps forward and three steps backward attempt to integrate and consolidate is that uh, I would say with significant prodding by outside forces in, in the nonprofit world, the Alaska legislature was prodded into sort of taking over the rail belt integration problem. And so we, we had a bill come through the legislature in 2020, which mandates that, that, we, that somebody form this thing. I don't know if it's an acronym outside of Alaska or if they just cooked it up. Electric Reliability Organization, fondly known as the ERO. And this ERO is supposed to um, do the reliability standards thing and 
do regional integrated resource planning from here on out. And it's supposed to be somewhat independent of the utilities. So that's that. Oh, and finally, uh, to give it some teeth, there's an explicit clause in this statute which says that the regulatory commission will finally have some pre-approval, a pre-build approval authority for large energy projects. Currently, we just operate on the uh, traditional regulatory model of uh, the utility builds it, comes in afterwards and says, hey, can we put this in our rates? And the commission either has to say uh, yes or no. And it's pretty hard to say no when uh, a co-op has built a $200, $200 million power plant. There's no shareholders to stick the cost on. So, we have had post-approval and this bill says here, henceforth you will have pre-approval, but um, a lot of details to work out whether that'll actually happen. So we're on the path toward reliability standards, regional integrated resource planning, and maybe some better oversight prior to construction. Now that we've overbuilt ourselves into the zone where we may not need any construction for the next 20 years. But I digress. This bill, just to reemphasize, does not create an ISO and it does not itself create the reliability standards. And it does not itself mandate what constitutes a balanced governance structure. Well, that's all up in the air right now. And it falls, what it does mandate is that our overworked regulatory commission has to adjudicate all of the details. And uh, the other thing that happened, which is probably significant to the whole, this whole um, drama, is that when the Anchorage utilities merged, which I talked about two slides ago, which was a big deal, the regulatory commission said, one of the conditions of you guys merging in Anchorage is that you have to now form a tight pool with your neighbors to the north. So I think many utility engineers would say that all this stuff about the ERO and the regional this and all that is, is somewhat of a of a theatrics because we now have, they would say, a functional type power pool that's covering 80% of the customers in the rail belt. Go ahead, Felicia, next slide. Now this is kind of a uh, non sequitur jump. We're gonna jump around on some topics. So that was one topic. One thing that's playing out right now is, is the SB 123 drama. How our, how our electric reliability organization is going to be formed and what it's gonna do. Another kind of fascinating little mini drama that's playing out because it ties right into climate change and carbon reduction is uh, the very first, and really the, not the very first, one of the major initial builds was this 28 megawatt coal power plant built near Fairbanks known as Healy One. And it's due for either retirement or it needs to get uh, a lot of new air pollution equipment to satisfy the EPA, which has sort of been giving them a long leash for a long time. And the reason that this is fascinating to me uh, is sort of a, a little vignette that, sh that shows uh, the situation with the rail belt in relation to renewables. So Alicia mentioned previously that if you, when we built a 25 megawatt wind farm in this, in this Fairbanks region, first of all, you can see that's functionally equivalent to a, a quote unquote major Coal generation plant. You know, we're not missing a zero here. It's only 28 megawatts, <laughs> which is tiny for a coal plant. So the wind farm is the size of the coal plant. And um, why that's interesting to me as an economist is that uh, a lot of people would say, or they did say, or they might say, 
hey, we can't really pay new wind and solar resources. We can't pay you much more than six cents a kilowatt hour because that's our avoided fuel cost for coal. It's cheap and we're gonna use it. But what's interesting about this plant is that if they retired it, uh, you'd get another four to five cents per kilowatt hour of, of avoided cost in a big lump of, of annual fixed O&M that would, that would disappear. So um, this is actually an issue that I studied in California way back in 1984 when they were starting up the whole avoided cost contracting operation. Uh, there was a huge docket open that summer and I spent a lot, of, a lot of time enjoying myself in the hearing room listening to everybody argue about, well, what is avoided cost? What is it really? Is it short run, long run, medium run? How do we calculate it? Blah, blah, blah. And this is, to me, is a good example of that debate or that conundrum carried into our situation. So just to, to um, tie it up, we have these, these um, lumps of generation. And if, if we could eliminate lumps with renewables, then the economic benefit would probably be significantly higher than just eliminating some fuel burn which is the way that we're now compensating uh, new wind and new solar. And we, we don't have slides about it, but there's been significant uh, fighting, polite fighting through the regulatory commission between IPPs wanting to sell more wind and utilities saying, we can't take it. Hey. So talking about renewable energy and IPPs and answering I believe, Sandy's question about wind energy. So there have been a couple of requests for proposals for renewable energy out there by the utilities, uh, one by Chugach, one by Golden Valley. Um, both of these were um, published last year. Um, I actually don't think Golden Valley accepted any of them, but they're still, they might still be in review. I'm not sure, Chugach is recent and they haven't awarded any yet. Um, in addition to those requests for proposals, um, Homer Electric is currently constructing a 90 megawatt hour Tesla battery, and um, they do have a like, carbon um, decarbonization goal, and um, I forget what the exact number is, but I do know that this battery, the, their goals with this battery is to increase the renewable energy penetration on their system. And there's also um, hope by the utilities as a whole to potentially tap into some of this upcoming federal transmission investments through um, this Build a Better Grid initiative that was just released, I think, a week or two ago. All right, next, uh, I'm going to go back to you, Steve. Maybe we can go through these um, real quickly. Yeah, before you do, I think I'm going to ask you to go back to your to your. It's because we're used to these maps, but I um, oh, yeah. want to emphasize that the, the key thing that, that we're hoping the feds or somebody will pay for is this weak link between the north and the south, which would uh, really solve a lot of problems in terms of sharing generation and accommodating renewables. So that's what everybody's got their fingers crossed or they've got their lobbying hats on to try to accomplish. Okay, go ahead. Um, in terms, uh, here's, a, here's a sort of optimistic slide about uh, distributed energy resources. We have a net metering um, as sort of a guideline, really. I'm not even sure it's a non-binding or it's part, of, part, part rule, part guideline. Uh, in our regulatory structure, which says you have to accept um, up to 1.5% of your average demand in the form of, of net metered capacity owned by customers. But all the utilities so far have happily uh, said we'll accept more than 1.5%. And in fact, all the utilities, almost all of them are, are well above 1.5%. 
And if you want to be really optimistic, you can do the math and say we've had average annual growth of 51% in installed net metering capacity, which is almost all solar, rooftop solar. And uh, on the other hand, it's still a drop in the bucket, but the growth pattern is, is pretty encouraging for solar in the Arctic. Go ahead. So now let's talk about decarbonization, which is which hope, hopefully will be the next the next big thing for the rail belt. Um, this picture is um, very helpful in understanding the, the decarbonization challenges and opportunities. And I think we we are on track to get done in in three minutes. I'm going to speed up. So two things to note are. Uh, really only maybe one thing to know. Golden Valley has big emissions because they burned coal. So there, that's also a big opportunity. The other utilities are burning gas. And the thing to note is that they've already made significant improvements in carbon emissions just by building more efficient gas plants. Go ahead. So, uh, Golden Valley's board set a 26% reduction goal, and it's not totally clear what they're actually going to now do to achieve it, but we studied it, and um, we'll leave the slides with you if you want to look at the details. We found it was achievable, and the reason it's achievable is because you got this coal target, the target of opportunity. If you just get rid of the coal, bingo, you can go down 26%. Let's go ahead. We're going to, Felicia, go all the way through this. Just skip it. Skip, 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 skip. Um, and skip MEA's decarbonization. And now you go ahead. I just wanted to um, give a little bit of summary of some of the engineering and stability challenges that I've kind of touched on throughout the presentation. Um, because we have so little transmission and so much generation. Um, the rail belt is very unique in the sense that it essentially functions as large, loosely connected microgrids. Um, and it's very different structure, whether or not you want to say that's really behind or really ahead, the lower 48, that's up to you. Um, uh, it's, it's very kind of bizarre. And at least all sorts of other potential issues when you want to um, build up the amount of renewable energy on your grid. Um, we also have, as we've mentioned, uh, no current reliability standards. Um, and even if the ERO enacts these, I actually don't know if they have any language in there for any enforcement. Um, but then in addition to that, there's questions because of this very unique structure, you know, do the reliability standards that are used by NERC, do they actually, would those be the best for Alaska or are there different standards? You know, there has to be a lot of development that goes into those to make sure they make sense for the rail belt's unique structure. And now as we increase renewable energy, very common problem with increasing inverter-based resources that have faster responses, um, we need to shift how we do controls and reserves and, and that can also involve um, an increased need for better communication between devices which Alaska also has unique challenges with um, because of the geographical expanse and not great connectivity across the state. And with the need for more reserves to handle um, greater renewables that leads into the need for um, more or higher capacity uh, inner ties between the regions. And then these long lines and the load leads to weak grids and that increases some um, interconnection costs associated with due to um, the need for reactive power compensation devices. And another interesting tidbit going back to the way um, Steve was talking about with EVs um, and also DERs, all the previous studies, the IRP um, and the EPS's transmission plan, they all assumed no change in load, whether that be from decrease from DERs or an increase from EVs, EVs or other benefit from electrification. And it's a big question of whether or not that is a good assumption. All these technologies have, you know, cold climate um, challenges with uptake of these devices. 
um, but it would really benefit from a study looking at what would be realistic growth um, for these instead of just assuming that there won't be any. Um, so Steve, if you can talk about the summary of economic and policy challenges. I've already covered it. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> um, so I just want to touch on the research that um, ASAP is doing for the rail belts and other research. Um, so there's, I'm going to go from bottom up and pass it over to Steve. So there's the Power Systems Integration Group, and that is the main group that I work with. We have a um, microgrid test bed that is supposed to replicate um, what the size and conditions of a real remote Alaska microgrid. And then we're also doing um, and starting to do more projects working with our electric utilities on the rail belts, particularly looking at wind um, and other studies. Uh, there's also the Alaska Hydrokinetic Energy Research Center, which does a lot of like river and wave hydrokinetics. And that's a picture of um, at the Tanana River down in Inanna of the water horse uh, river energy converter. Um, Steve will talk about the top four. Yeah, we, we really need to get to Q&A. So the top four are pretty much self-explanatory. BEE stands for Beneficial and Equitable Electrification. So we're looking at a lot of the same things that everyone else is looking at, just on a, a tiny scale in a really cold place. So I think we should go ahead. Uh, so um, I'll briefly touch on, um, so working with ASAP, and everyone who's interested in working in ASAP, the deadline for this is actually already closed. Uh, but in partnership with Stanford, um, we did have, we were sponsoring a um, project through the Schultz Energy Fellowships um, to assist us with our rail belt decarbonization study. Um, but unfortunately, the application is closed. Um, but what has not, the application hasn't closed yet for um, our undergraduate, in, undergraduate summer internship program. Um, the deadline for this for undergrads is February 14th. There are several projects from energy efficiency, nuclear energy, renewable energy. Um, and that would be this summer, which is paid, um, including housing. And then as always, if there's any prospective graduate students um, who are interested in these topics, uh, feel free to reach out to me. All right, so now it's Q&A. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I noticed that there are uh, eight questions. Four of them have been answered by Felicia and the other four haven't. Now, I, I, let me share my screen. Uh, can you see the Q&A, the questions? I can, I can see them. Yes, um, so some of them have been, I think four of them have been answered by Felicia. Yeah, I think I, I, I propose that uh, we should take the reactive power challenge. I think that's a really interesting one to, to just flesh out a little bit. Which question is that? It's Sandy Lawrence's, I'm, I'm looking at the Q&A box. It's Sandy Lawrence's, please explain reactive power. In oh, ACL. reactive power, okay. Yeah, oh, please, oh. I'm, I'm going uh, so reactive power and AC lines. So when you have long lines with low loads, um, when you have a lowly lo low loaded uh, AC line, you end up having to need a lot of reactive power um, to keep those lines stable because your voltage will um, have large swings in response to small changes in power on either end of the line. Um, so what you have are these uh, reactive power compensation devices um, facts or like static fire compensators and devices like that that inject reactive power um, where these long lines exist to help stabilize the voltage. Um, okay. Other questions okay. here. And two more questions from uh, Sandy Lawrence. Alicia, I could try the tidal power if you if you don't want. Yeah, why don't you jump on tidal power? So there is a Sandy. There is a good location. Uh, we have some of the highest 
tides uh, comparable to the Bay of Fundy, I think, around the Cook Inlet, which is the region close to Anchorage. And there have been studies to actually put, put in essentially a dam across part of Cook Inlet, I guess that's what you call it, to capture the tidal flux. Uh, it's, it's still being studied. And my impression is that it's technically, seems to be technically feasible, but very expensive. And so I, I, I'm guessing that the focus of the study now, studies now is to try to identify ways to make it less expensive through some kind of technical innovation or better understanding of, of how to do it. But it's one of these things where you have a lot of megawatts, but it would take, it would be a, a you know, significant disruption of the tidal ecosystem to capture that. Uh, Fletcher, I love your question. So I'm gonna jump, jump on that one unless, uh, yeah, and Fletcher, Fletcher's question and Aviva's, they kind of blend together. So the, the major effective uh, pressure to create the arrow came from the NGO sector within Alaska. We have a uh, organization called Renewable Energy Alaska Project or REAP, and they have been working for years to try to consolidate the rail belt in a way that would uh, admit more renewables onto the grid. So my read, I'm, I'm not totally in the loop, but my read is that it was in in-state NGO action got the legislature to pass this uh, bill for the ERO and also just exhaustion from everything else having failed. Uh, so then turning to uh, Aviva's question, uh, the co-ops are responsive to their boards. So my way of thinking, the political economy revolves around how are the boards elected and how many members are actually involved in, the, in that part of the process. And I don't really have a good answer. It's never really been studied. But when, when, when the boards get their act, not their act together, when the boards decide to take action, the co-op boards, it really does have an effect. And it has more of an effect in the smaller co-ops. So in, in Golden Valley, the board is definitely leading, leading the charge toward decarbonization. And the management is, I would say, dutifully following along. They're not leading, but they're not really blocking it either, at least not so far. I want to quickly touch on the question earlier. Does a weak uh, electricity and gas interconnection give rise to equity issues in the rail belt region? So there are definitely equity issues in the rail belt, and our colleague Michelle Wilbur is leading the beneficial and equitable electrification group doing research on this. Um, I don't know if the weak electricity and gas interconnection directly relates to the equity issues in the rail belt, um, but similar equity issues around like rooftop solar and hosting capacity that are found in lower 48 are also found here. And there is also a significant equity issue due to the cost of electricity in the remote microgrids in Alaska versus the um, rail belt region and the amount of state funding and the proportionateness of that state funding. Um, but that's a little different than the rail belt. We're kind of on time, but uh, we can go a little bit, uh, five more minutes, and, you know, if, if people have more questions or if you Well, I, I wanted to chime in on the equity, uh, the equity, equity thing. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Just two, two little this tidbits. Question number three. Yeah. yeah uh, I just want to say that I'm not sure that the weak interconnections themselves are causing problems, but we, we do have significant equity and energy justice issues. And um, I think a, a lot of them relate. We, we, have a, we have a rate structure that's heavily tilted toward um, loading up the energy charge with our fixed costs. 
And so you can you can talk about whether that's inequitable because it means that um, it's good or bad for equity. And we've had, I would argue, we've had several programs and may still have several programs that basically reward people who or who, who don't need it because they've already got capital to invest. And we sometimes reward them for doing things with rebates or give backs. And those programs are completely off the, you know, they're out of reach for a lot of folks. And I'm and some of us are concerned that that's going to be the case with EV incentives as we move into EV. So it's nothing new, but you know, the same kinds of issues that a lot of other people are facing. Okay, so do we have any more questions from students in the, in the classroom or, or people who join us uh, online? Okay, let's uh, thank the two speakers. Uh, this is a, a, a very interesting talk. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.